Hello everyone, and welcome to this review of The Winner's Effect by Ian Robertson. So, we'll be focusing on the two sections of this book, Are We Born to Win? and Is Winning a Matter of Chance and Circumstance? So let's get into it. So, in the first chapter of Are We Born to Win? It talks about the mystery of Pablo Picasso's son, and it evaluates why is Pablo Picasso's son not as successful as Pablo Picasso himself. And so one of the first thing the book delves into is it mentions a study. And the study is basically the fulfillment and happiness of students in richer high schools and more affluent areas in comparison to those in poorer high schools and much more poorer areas. So what the evaluation of this study is basically that the students in richer areas are less happy and less fulfilled than the ones in poorer areas. And so we have to think for a second, why is this? What is the reason? And so it explains in the book the reason being that in the poorer areas, there's much more parental involvement. The parents are around much more, whereas in the richer areas, the parents are not. So therefore, this would cause a much more, much more of a growth in resentment and abandonment toward the, toward the sons, toward the parent, if that makes sense. The, the sons and the daughters and of those parents would basically not hold their parents in as high regard as they're, they're not around in their day-to-day -day lives. And so the oxymoron in this situation is if you actually ask the parent themselves, why is it that you're working so hard, they would most likely say for their sons or daughters. But the sad truth is that their parental involvement causes increased risk, uh, no, resentment and, uh, and kind of hatred. Therefore, there's a greater distance and there's not as well as a developed relationship between the parent and the child. And so that kind of idea is that Paolo Picasso never got to spend as much time with his father, therefore he caused a much more resentment and most likely looked for more out, most likely looked for more of a, more of a, um, look for other things as to express himself. And most likely that would only build up his resentment and kind of hatred towards his father weakening and breaking and the breaking down of that relationship as a whole so that's one of the first reasons a second reason is pablo picasso and the people around him so the people around pablo picasso himself would be calling him the son and pablo picasso would be calling him el rey himself el rey which means the king so the idea there is that he's being built up constantly and he's constantly being pushed up pushed up and elevated so when you have a son who's just there like, so uh, my dad's the son, how can I be anything in comparison? How can he even have a chance? So therefore he's going to be demotivated to winning as a whole. So therefore, so therefore if he's demotivated to winning as a whole, he's most likely not going to win as much. And so not only is the resentment and build up, but also the kind of grandiosity and the build up of the father is this kind of godlike figure, which is entirely, uh, incorrect is uh is what actually holds him back and also what demotivates him from wanting to pursue winningness is how can i be anything in comparison to my father who is already so great and this is actually uh more to blame on the father's uh areas than the son's and that's what brings me on to the third chapter the third chapter being called hiding the ladder so what people what happens is because he's built up as this great grandiose the son, this amazing person, he kind of um, hides ladder, inst hides the ladder. Instead of admitting he is someone who has worked hard, who has painted for years on years, who has painted every single day, ev in every bit of his spare time, he's instead kind of gone to this idea of it's God given. I'm a God. This is was provided to me. There was no work went into it. I just became this amazing painter that could uh, basically move people. You see that kind of idea that the process is being hidden from the sun and so the sun can't actually see the process as a whole so therefore he thinks there is no other path to actually reach this kind of to reach success and to win in life is it's being blocked by his by his father kind of not explaining and these people around his father allowing him to be pushed up as a figure and him kind of staying there as a meager human who, regardless of how hard he works, will never be anything in comparison. So that brings us on to genetic fatalism. And so genetic fatalism is how many times have you heard about the super gifted student 
in a class maybe of yours or on the news about how gifted they were at such a young age and how basically they either turn into a crackhead or a, or a drug abuser or one of the things. And so it del delves into the psychology of genetic fatalism. And so the psychology of genetic fatalism is actually quite interesting. The idea that you're, you're, you're genetically born with your intelligence. So by being genetically born with your intelligence, there is no way you can actually improve or get better. Momentally, you think that at least not actually, that is not actually the case for, per se. So it talks about this kid who went to uh, one of his um, clinics and the parents were very stressed saying he's failing. And it's because he's not been, it's because he's had the, all this kind of idea his entire life that he's smart, he's smart, he's smart. The parental pressure pushed on him has said he's smart, he's gifted. He's smart, he's gifted. So therefore, people who have this idea of thinking that their smarts are much more inherent are therefore much more likely to be to have increased cortisol levels, cortisol being stress, much more likely stress, much higher stress levels, sorry, uh, in comparison to failure. So by having these in increased stress levels to failure, therefore means that they will um, basically kind of reject the failure. So let's say they failed a test, for example. So they failed the test, they got a, a B when they could have got an A, all right? That kind of idea that therefore their response to that would be much more negative. Whereas someone who's been told that their that their intelligence is not genetic and can change, that what they all, their personality is therefore not rooted in that intelligence being a part of them because that intelligence can change and shift into whatever. So therefore their their perception of failure is much less. So therefore they will have decreased cortisol levels, so decreased stress to the failure, therefore causing them to not kind of to not um, shy away from it and therefore improve upon failures. So it's a kind of a, it talks about a fundamental flaw in society that we give, ch the, we give children this kind of, these names, these, uh, these labels, and we kind of say you can't, you can't shift from them because we've placed you in that and that's a part of the, your society. And so from the aspect of social conformity, those children take on what that society has said and from what that society said has ultimately led to the downfall of those children because those children would be much more susceptible to shying away from failure. So therefore, they'd be much more looking towards outlooks to get away from that failure. Anyway, so that's a kind of idea of genetic fatalism. And then the curse of parental ego is also involved in genetic fatalism itself. Genetic, um, no, hiding the ladder, not genetic fatalism. So what I mean by the curse of parental ego is I mean that the parents have an inflated self-importance to their sons and daughters. And by having that inflated self-importance, self it means that they are much more likely to uh, hide the ladder. They're much more likely to say, again, this is a God-given gift. I, I, did not have, I did not work my ass off for it. That kind of idea that they hide. They're, they're hiding the ego. And I've obviously spoken about this in previous videos with ego as the enemy and how that basically inhibits the son old daughter from actually the son in this case being Paolo from actually thinking he can achieve anything of merit or worth anyway so that's the idea so in conclusion are we born to win no winning is dependent on your one your need to achieve so your need of achievement and that actually brings me on to something I missed out so last thing in this is they did a study where they offered money and then another study where they offered where they were testing the intelligence and what you found is the uh, money study, uh, there, was less, there was less desire to walk toward the money as they felt they were being given it. They felt that it was expected if they felt that it was paid for. Whereas the test of intelligence, there was much more motivation towards it and there was a much more, it was taken much more seriously because their intelligence was being proven. And by being proven there, they have a higher level of achievement. So the higher level need of achievement, not the higher level of it, but the higher the higher the ability to need to achieve, therefore influence them greater. So no, we are not born to win. But winning is dependent on basically how bad you want it in the book it states. Now, the second section is, is winning a matter of chance or, and circumstance? All right, so let me get into this. So the idea, he sp speaks about these fishes. This is quite funny, but it, it, it does make very much sense. So I do promise you it will be worth listening to this. So it talks about this fish. And so basically, let's just, if I was to make this in societal terms, it can be easily understood. I'd say 
alpha fish, beta fish, yeah? Alpha fish and beta fish, see? So the alpha fish is much greater than the beta fish and the beta fish is much more fearful of the alpha fish and the alpha fish is much more aggressive. So he looks into why these, why, I know now, this is where I missed something out. So yeah, alpha fish and beta fish. And then he talks about why can this beta fish become an alpha fish? And so what he does is he delves into the reasons as to why that beta fish literally develops the characteristics of the alpha fish and literally takes on colors and therefore goes from infertile to fertile. So let, I'm gonna explain basically his reasons for it and how he applies that to other metrics in our society. So one of the first things he speaks about is investment bankers. So investment bankers are in London, for example. So when you're investment banking, you're basically you're investing so you can either win or lose on the day. And he found, he found that when he reviewed a study, the study stated that the greater the win on the day led to increased levels of testosterone in the investment bankers. That increased level of testosterone therefore caused them to be more aggressive and take higher risk toward, toward basically investing more, which would therefore compound itself onto basically earning more because they've taken a high, greater risk. So they could either result in more losses, which would decrease testosterone or greater wins, which would actually increase it. So that, that kind of idea that the more you win, it can basically cause your in testosterone and hormonal levels to increase, therefore causing you to go from infertile to possibly fertile, is in this Fisher's case. Anyway, now the second example he used was uh, the World Cup, 1994 World Cup of Brazil versus Italy. So I believe Brazil won. And so what they did is they tested the testosterone levels. And so the testosterone levels, as I'm sure you would assume from what I've just said, uh, the it Italians testosterone levels as a country actually decreased. So therefore they were much less rebellious. Whereas in Brazil, they were much more rebellious. There was, there was a greater level of increase in testosterone. So there's a greater level of rebellion, breaking of the law, smashing up things to celebrate their win. So that kind of idea that you're winning and you're losing can actually influence your hormonal levels as a whole. All right, so that, there's, that's that one. Then it talks about the winner's effect. So the winner's effect is basically, if you win once, you have a greater chance of winning at twice, <laughs> basically, similar. So he used the example of Mike Tyson. So when Mike Tyson first came out of jail to build, up, to build him up and his confidence and his beliefs, basically, they made him fight two really easy opponents. I believe that's what they say. And these two really easy, easy opponents get completely destroyed by Mike Tyson. And then when he goes to do a title fight, he completely destroys him. And that's based on the fact that he's already gained and built momentum. And so what they then do is they talk about how this, this winner's effect only actually works on home territory. And they go into why does it only work on home territory? And the reason why it works on home territory is that your affiliation between winning and cues. So cues, so things that Cues are a, a series of patterns that happen to you. So I'll explain it very quickly. So he goes into talk about how Vietnam soldiers were addicted to heroin. It's quite, I know, quite extreme. But um, by those Vietnam soldiers being entirely addicted to heroin, when they came back, they were not addicted to heroin. So why was this? Well, this is because of the cues. So the smell of the lab, maybe the hearing of gunfire, those cues influence them to because influence them to be more susceptible to higher levels of stress, obviously, because you're in a war zone. So, <laughs> so yeah, because you're in a war zone, they therefore uh, found out, what's it? Outsources? So uh, us basically sources to take them away from the stress, so the heroin itself. So by having, by basically taking them away from all these cues, these cues are no longer there, so therefore they are cured of the cues. So that's kind of the idea of the winner's effect as a whole. And then this is what it brings me into um, the beliefs and your attitudes. And uh, so that's the environment around you. And so I'll explain that later. So th so then next broad point is the body language. Body language dictates your power. So if you slump, for example, on a chair, your, your, I believe your testosterone would decrease and you'd have an increased level of cortisol. Cortisol, again, being, as I said earlier, stress. So this is why people basically, um, this is why individuals, 
hold themselves in power stances and, you know, put their hands on their hips. They call it, I think they call it Superman powers. I don't really know personally. But, um, yeah, so this idea that you can, if you have your hands on your hips or you have, like, your, your, you're holding a fist, you have greater levels of uh, testosterone increase and decreased level of cortisol being stressed. So they do this with Vladimir Putin. So when Vladimir Putin wants to um, insult, I believe, an opponent... Not insult, uh, insult a rival politician of another country, for example. What he would do is he'd lay back in his chair. And that laying back in his chair will basically signal to his brain that he's much more relaxed. And he will feel in much more control of the situation as a whole. All right. And then this is what, and then this is what brings me on to unconscious prejudice. So the unconscious prejudice, it talks about Barack Obama and how the unconscious prejudice in female and male stereotypes and in people of color, for example, and how basically Barack Obama becoming the president completely shattered the pre unconscious prejudice people had toward uh, people, of people of color. So therefore it was a greater, there was, therefore he actually influenced people's prejudice. And the way they study this kind of prejudice is they'd associate, um, and this is where this could get controversial here, so please uh, viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> but no, so um, they basically get you, but they give you a button. So let's say a powerful and weak, and then they do woman maybe weak and men powerful, and then maybe they do woman powerful, men weak, and they get you to press the button each time. However, what they do is they make you press the button so fast that you actually have no idea your unconscious brain is activated and your conscious brain is not. So what they did is, I'm sure you can expect, and this is why I assume I'll get the most hate, is uh, they found that um, men powerful was was uh, pressed more than with, and was associated more with men powerful than and woman was associated more with weakness. So regardless of what people actually say or say or say they believe in is actually not true as in comparison to their unconscious desires. So Barack Obama completely shattered this kind of pre unconscious prejudice by actually becoming the first black president of America. And so by doing that, he, yeah, again, shattered the unconscious prejudice. And this is what brings us on to beliefs. So beliefs again are, and this is what brings me on to the fish. And this is where beliefs and fish and what else did I say? Cues will intervene. So T fish, which are basically the alpha fish, as I said, I actually just used their sophisticated name. The alpha fish are more colourful. So the alpha fish being more colourful means they're more susceptible to being spotted by seagulls. And uh, not seagulls, but by birds, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, being spotted more by birds. And so, therefore, they hide. So what these beta fish do is these beta fish overtake their territory when they go hide or when they're maybe eaten, for example. So therefore, their territory is unguarded. So they come in and they take the territory. By taking the territory, their unconscious beliefs have been absolutely shattered because they've just taken territory, which they probably believed they could never take. Secondly, they've now got a cue of the taking of the territory between winning and therefore they are going to have their belief system as a fish, I know it's quite funny, as a fish has changed. So their belief system changing has caused them to in have increased chance of, uh, no, to increase their fertility and to increase levels of testosterone and to basically turn them into alpha fish. So the beta fish have gone from the, to the alpha fish based on a change in belief, winning, as well as as well as that increase in testosterone that comes with the winning and the taking over of the territory, causing them to be more aggressive and therefore more sexually appealing toward other fish. I know it's very, very strange. However, it explains it great. And I hope I've explained that well to you and I'll see you in the next one where we probably will re review the other sections of the book. Anyway, uh, have a nice rest of your day and thanks for listening.